So, of course, yes, I'm doing the biography of John Singer Sargent. As many of you may know, the exhibition has just opened at the Tate on Sargent and Fashion, which I recommend going to see. It's fabulous. It's, it's fabulous. It, it opened last week, um, transferred over from, from Boston. So actually earlier last week, I was in Tite Street giving a tour to a group of sort of sergeant experts that were in town. We went to go see the sergeant house, which is just across the street at number 31. And, um, and then we came here and, and had a look in the room. So um, if you go to the exhibition, you'll see the um, original Ellen Terry um, painting that Sargent did in 1889, along with the fabulous dress that was um, um, constructed by Aidan Nettleship, but actually designed by a woman called Alice Collins Carr, who was one of the great sort of aesthetic grand dames of the day. Um, so, yes, Robert asked if I would read this passage, which I think most of you probably know, um, which is from an autobiography written by W. Graham Robertson, the writer, who was actually being painted by Sargent across the street at number 33. And if you go to the Tate exhibition, you'll see it there. It's part of the Tate's permanent collection. But um, in, I think it was 1933, Graham Robertson wrote this very famous memoir and everyone's in it from the day Ellen Terry, Lily Langtree, John Singer Sargent, which is this chapter. And um, and he writes about um, Wilde seeing the painting. So I'll just read it to you. If that's right. um, so this is actually from a chapter called John Sargent. In 1894, I blossomed into a notable personage myself. It was a secondhand notability, a reflected aureole, but distinctly noticeable. I dined out in it for a couple of seasons, and even now it sheds an occasional glimmer upon an otherwise unillumined name. More or less, by accident, I became the subject of one of John Sargent's most famous pictures. Sargent was still a young man. Nobody was very old in the early 90s. <laughs> <laughs> and Tite Street, Chelsea, did not as yet show the unending procession on its way to his studio, that thronged it in later days, which is at number 33. And when you leave here, number 31, if you walk down, the building is still there. You can see where all the ladies used to stand in front of his studio waiting to have their portrait. Um, but several distinguished clients had already passed that way. And as Oscar Wilde observed to me, quote, the street that on a wet and dreary morning has vouchsafed the vision of Lady Macbeth in full regalia magnificently seated in a four-wheeler, can never again be as other streets. It must always be full of wonderful possibilities. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, can you just explain about Sargent having two studios? Yes, so when Sargent painted this portrait, he had just moved in to a studio across the street. It is also still there, but is currently, apparently being gutted. There's a huge skip out in front. It's terrible. I, I don't even want to know. But um, it was actually originally lived in by James Whistler, the American artist, um, who had built that. I mean, I, I can give you the full sort of the history, but I'm sure you've all sort of read it in the book. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> but at least one of you has at least reviewed the book, so very kindly. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so um, Whistler left uh, in 1884. Sargent moved in fresh from Paris. This horrible scandal with the Madame X portrait, which is actually also in the exhibition. Um, this American heiress who was in Paris, low cut dress. The, one of the, um, the straps was down over her shoulder and it caused a huge scandal. He was basically cancelled in Paris in 1884 when it came out. And so he came over to London and he was drifting around um, various people's studios. Um, and he ended up going to the village of Broadway for a while and painted this fantastic picture, Carnation Lily, Lily Rose, which is also in the Tate collection. It was one of the first pictures by an American to be purchased by the Chantry Bequest. Anyway, all of this. So that picture, I think, sort of redeemed um, Sargent's belief in his own art. He decided to stay in London, and of all the places in this city that he could take a studio, he chose number 33, recently vacated by Whistler. And one of the very first portraits that he did there 
was Ellen Terry. Mm -hmm. She debuted in Henry Irving's production of Macbeth at the Lyceum Theatre in sort of the very end of December 1888. Sargent went to the opening night, which was an invitation-only event, <laughs> carriages all down the Strand. It was the big society event of the season, really. And, um, and it's, it's a role that she wanted to play for a very long time. Um, Sergeant went, he sat next to the dress designer, Alice Commons Carr, and was completely entranced by the way her costume moved when she came out on stage. And he said, I want to paint her. So he went to her dressing room afterwards and said, I'd love to do your portrait. Sergeant was not known in London at the time. So she really didn't know <clears throat> who's this young man that wants to paint my portrait. She also didn't know if her production would be a success. So she waited until the reviews came out, they were glowing. And she said, fine, I'll go to your studio and sit for you. So in the early months of 1889, she came to Tide Street on a sort of three times a week in her carriage, dressed in this fabulous costume um, and had the portrait painted. In about three months, she tried different um, poses. Um, he had her marching up and down the studio to let the gown flow, um, but decided that wasn't what he wanted. Actually, um, he wanted this picture to focus on her. This scene actually isn't in the play at all. She, Lady Macbeth never takes the crown. This is something that he completely made up. But I just love it because you get this intensity in her eyes, which is exactly what she was trying to do in this performance, was actually um, bring a sort of, um, you know, in, in past performances, Lady Macbeth was always this mad, tyrannical, murderous woman. And she wanted to bring a sort of sense of uh, feminine charm isn't quite the right, but a, sort of a, a nuance to it. So he, he, he posed her like this. And actually, one of the things that is quite striking about the painting is the blue flecks that you get in the dress. When you go to the tape and look, they're not in the dress. Those are something that came out specifically by... Um, when you also see it's beetle wings that are sewn on here and you notice that um, when you see it at the Tate and it could be the lighting I don't know but you don't see the blue this was actually Burne Jones Edward Burne Jones who came to Sargent's studio to comment on the painting mm -hmm. and he said you should actually bring out the blue um, to contrast the green so I think it gives it that um, and the, the, the blue here it's just uh, it's quite striking so mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> There it is. Um, um, but also, I think we sh should remember as well that Oscar um, reviewed that production uh, and was hugely <laughs> impressed by it. And like Sargent, was very impressed by Ellen Terry's dress. And in his review, <coughs> he wrote, Lady Macbeth seems to be an economical housekeeper and evidently patronises local industries for her husband's clothes and servants' liveries. But she takes care to do all her own shopping in Byzantium. It's a wonder. So this quote of Graham Robertson mm. is allegedly, I mean, I always thought Wilde is sort of sitting here at his desk mm. watching her come down the street. Mm. But actually, when you look out this window, 33 is way down there. I mean, I'm not sure he was actually sitting at the desk or if he made this up, or maybe he was standing on the, the foot, on the, the front the step or something. Or did he not go to her, to the studio? I mean, it was mm. just there. I mean, um, it's, it's quite possible. But she would have turned, so he's seen her in the, in, in the, in the, in the cab, hasn't he? So she, what was the one-way system at that time? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Wouldn't she have been coming down <laughs> past his door? He, he yes. He meant a four-wheeler. Four he wheeler. says that she's magnificently seated in a four-wheeler. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. very possible yeah. that he yeah. saw her yeah. cruising yeah. down the, yeah. you know, yeah. the street. But yeah. Joe raised an interesting question just as we were coming in here about why did Sergeant never... Paint wild. I mean, they, they, they got half of yes, there is a drawing. So Sargent met Wilde in Paris yeah, in 1883 right. when he was over there working on the, the Duchess. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there's this great letter that Sargent, or that Wilde, Sargent is inviting Wilde to his studio, but gives him this secret knock, you know. Um, to get in because he doesn't, Sergeant doesn't want any other visitors in, but he'll accept Wilde, recently returned from his American lecture tour. Um, so, and at the time, of course, 
he had Madam X. Not finished, but she would have been there. So Wilde would have seen one of the early versions of Madam X. And what was that like, I wonder? And then, and then they had coffee later at this, you know, bohemian coffee shop called La Venue, which is right around the corner on the Boulevard Montparnasse, where all the young artists used to go. And, um, and Wilde apparently, and it comes from various sources, Drew, oh, sorry, Sergeant Drew Wilde in this album that he kept. Where is it? You know, it's one of the great oh, yeah. unlost yeah. things. So if any of you ever see it. Did he paint mainly women or did he paint women and men? Oh, he painted both, but he actually, he painted more women. But Oscar was supposed to not be that attractive, wasn't he? Like realistically, even though we all think he is in the photographs. Yeah. The Tate exhibition does have rather paint? a lot of beautiful young men rather than yeah. older men. Yeah. Or even handsome yeah. older men. That, that's yeah. right. We're left with Pennington's portrait. He tended, people tended to commission their for, portraits mm. for their wives, mm. you know. Uh, Wilde well, might just not have wanted to pay for it. Well, that, <laughs> that too. Al 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 although Sargent did paint a lot of his friends for did free, yeah. um, but maybe... <laughs> well, maybe they just didn't get on. I, I mean, of course, you know, but I mean, Sargent's personality remains slightly opaque, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Not when the book is published, uh, anyway. It, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Actually, I think, uh, <laughs> I think they got along really well. Mm -hmm. um, in 1895, actually, it's quite interesting, on the day that Wilde was arrested, the 5th of April, the day before, Sargent was having an enormous party at his studio, um, sort of while this horrible event is taking place, um, Sargent took off to um, the following day, while Oscar's being arrested, um, to Boston, So, mm -hmm. um, and he was there for, for many months. but. It, there's such a proximity. He had to know that these horrible things were going on. We know that he signed the autograph book for Constance in 1894. Um, Sargent had some not nice things to say about Dorian Gray. Um, he, it wasn't his favorite <laughs> book, but he did like The Decay of Lying. He liked Wilde's essays, which is interesting. Um, he later was a big, well, he later championed to have Wilde included on the murals for the Chelsea, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah. town hall, um, which he was the chair of that committee. And then um, he also was a big champion of Robbie Ross during the Crossland trials and wrote him numerous letters saying, you know, we're on your side and we support you in that sort of horrible event.